have a, another study that looks at different aspects of, uh, of staging and uh, uh, more. Um, Dr. Zelinsky presented to us a retrospective uh, experience, an extremely large one, that uh, has uh, changed practice in their hospital. And now I'd like to call on Dr. Rintoul to tell us about the uh, ASTER study, looking at quality of life, a major issue for all of our patients in all uh, aspects, and cost effectiveness, an increasingly important analysis to be done. Dr. Rintoul. Thank you very much. And very thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this study with you. As has been said, what I'm going to discuss today is the cost effectiveness and the quality of life results from the ASTA study. Now, I'm presenting this on behalf of the ASTA investigators, who I'll come to in a moment. Uh, the ASTA study, which was published in JAMA in November last year, and the reference for that, for those of you who are interested, is at the bottom of the abstract on the handout, um, was uh, a multi-centre study. Um, across four centres in three countries and essentially it was endobronchial and endoscopic ultrasound combined versus surgical staging, whether that was cervical or mediastinoscopy or VATS or left anterior mediastinosomy in patients with potentially resectable lung cancer. And it was very much designed as a real world study to address a very important clinical question. Uh, essentially, the, as has been said already, the key clinical issue here is to determine prior to surgical resection for lung cancer, you have to know whether the tumour has spread to the mediastinal lymph nodes in the centre of the chest. If it has already spread, you may operate, but more commonly, patients get referred for chemo radiotherapy. Now, historically, this has usually been performed by a standard cervical mediastinoscopy, this surgical evaluation. This is the so-called gold standard currently that is uh, performed in almost every thoracic surgical centre around the world uh, and has been done so for many years. More recently, as you've heard, uh, endobronchial ultrasound and endoscopic ultrasound have been developed and a number of case series as often happens with new techniques, as we've just heard with Temla, initially suggest that the data and the technique is very good. Uh, but the key thing, I think, to, the point to make here is that having got a new technique, you really do have to evaluate it side by side in a prospective, randomised style uh, with the um, pre-existing standard, which is exactly what we set out to do. So. The clinical data, the clinical effectiveness data has already been published and presented previously at ASCO last year and the ERS. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a multi-centre study. Uh, it was led by uh, Yauka Anima and Leiden and Kurt Tourne in Lerb and, uh, uh, sorry, Ghent and um, Christoph Dooms in uh, Lerb and myself in Cambridge. And we had 241 patients who were randomised in a one-to-one -one fashion to either undergo standard surgical staging, which about 98% of the time was mediastinoscopy, or to have endobronchial and endoscopic ultrasound. And in the event that the EBUS and EUS was negative for malignancy, these patients went on to have uh, check surgical staging by, say, mediastinoscopy usually before going on to have thoracotomy. And thoracotomy with a systematic lymph node dissection was the ultimate gold standard. Now, the main result from the YASTA study uh, was that assessing the lymph nodes with the uh, endoscopic approaches was significantly more effective than using surgical staging mediastinoscopy. Uh, surgical staging on its own, the sensitivity was 79%. Uh, using EBUS and EUS uh, together and alone was 85%, and there was actually no significant difference between those two groups. But if you used EBUS in EUS, and as I said earlier, confirmed your negative findings with surgical staging, that boosted the sensitivity to 94%. So at the end of the day, it was 94% versus 79%, which was highly significant. And as I say, we feel this has been a practice-changing development. So moving on to the quality of life and the resource use, what we did was we collected quality of life data before, during and after the interventions 
So essentially we got baseline data using something called the Euroqual EQ5D questionnaire, which asks patients a very simple questionnaire, five different domains of their uh, sort of day-to-day -day functioning. We then ask them to repeat the questionnaire, which takes two minutes to complete. Um, after they've had the interventions, either the endobronchial endoscopic intervention or the surgical intervention, and then again at two months and six months down the line. And we also collected resource use data for six months because even with a diagnostic study as this was, it's very important to find out what happens to patients down the line for several months because you want to check that the patients in one arm of the study or the other arm of the study, something funny isn't happening and they're, they're having more surgery or more chemotherapy. So we collected resource use data in each country on the uh, patients having EBC US having surgical staging, having thoracotomies for lung cancer resection, those who went on to have subsequent chemotherapy or subsequent radiotherapy and all hospital and hospice admissions. And we got a very detailed and complete data set. So essentially the results, the quality of life data, um, as you'll see in the abstract on the handout, we had available for about 60% of the patients. We didn't start the quality of life data quite at the beginning of the study, but we had it for 60% of the patients overall. And essentially that showed that at baseline the quality of life, as you would expect between the two groups, because they were well balanced, was very, very similar. But um, after the endoscopic interventions, those in the endoscopic arm, they had significantly better quality of life. Because this, as you can imagine, this is using flexible telescopes in the esophagus of the airway, it's a day case, it's under, under local sedation and anest uh, local anesthetic and sedation. It doesn't involve surgery. Uh, and these patients had a much easier time of it than those undergoing surgery. At two months and six months, there was no difference in the quality of life. The resource use data showed that actually there was no significant difference in costs between the two strategies. You'll see on the handout that actually there was a, a trend to a difference. It's actually about worked out to about 750 UK pounds in favour of the endoscopic strategy, uh, which equates to about 850 euros or 1,200 US dollars. Um, so it looks like it is cheaper. Um, but there was actually technically no significant difference. So in conclusion, I think combining the clinical data and this new cost effectiveness data, we can say that uh, assessing the lymph glands initially with an endoscopic approach is A, more effective, B, better tolerated by patients, and C, is no more expensive than the surgical approaches. And therefore, we recommend that in future, these endoscopic approaches, which are now widespread and spreading rapidly around the world, uh, should be used initially, uh, reserving uh, a standard cervical mediastinoscopy, which again is widespread and available in most centers around the world, as a backup um, if endoscopy doesn't show any evidence of cancer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just uh, one quick question. Uh, do you recall from your study uh, approximately what percentage of patients then starting with uh, the ultrasound uh, uh, methods uh, would then require mediastinoscopy? 55%. Uh, okay, so it's relatively similar, 40 to 55% uh, between the two studies that we hear. Um, questions from the press? Uh, Stephen Pinn, Doctors Net UK. Um, I just want you to clarify the economic implications of the study. You talked about the difference, uh, the £750 saving not being st uh, statistically significant. But am I right in thinking from the abstract that in those patients that only required the uh, endoscopic approach alone, yeah. the savings were considerably greater? Indeed. Um, you're, quite, you're quite right. You're spot on. The data I presented was uh, initially... Um, based on the actual two arms of the study. But in, indeed, if you do a subset analysis and you say, okay, if you've done an EBUS and EUS and that's all you need and you don't need surgical staging, um, then the cost uh, moves markedly in favor of the endoscopic arm, uh, as you say, to the tune of about 2,100 pounds. Um, and at the moment, there is uh, debate uh, in the medical community as to whether if you have a negative EBUS in EUS, whether you actually do need to go on to do surgical staging, 
as a backup before going on to do uh, surgical resection or not, or whether you can skip that step. Now, at the moment, as a result of the ASTA uh, data, the ASTA PIs are saying, yes, you should, but in fact, um, what happens is that you have uh, the EBUS EUS sensitivity alone was 85%, the combined was 94%, so that's a 9% increase. That means that you have to do 11 mediastinoscopies more mediastinoscopies on 11 patients to find one patient that's got mediastinal disease that your endoscopic approach missed. And uh, therefore, you can then you have to balance up the clinical, uh, the ethical, and the cost effectiveness argument. And that will keep the debate going, I suspect, for some time to come. Right. Um, Sometimes one of the complications of cost effectiveness is if you look at all costs. So this is just one element of the costs of taking someone initially found to have lung cancer. You have the downstream costs of radiation therapy, chemotherapy, surgery, etc., on both arms. So it, it, it's uh, this is why prevention is such an important aspect uh, and screening because you can prevent many of these uh, downstream costs if you, if you have smoking cessation, et cetera, why smoking is so very, very expensive for uh, all of our countries. But um, the approach that we're hearing here is uh, that we have some debate within the medical community about uh, a negative mediastinum uh, as to whether you can go directly to surgery or not. This has been actually a debate for a long period of time. If we go back just a few years, it was recommended by many that everyone have mediastinoscopy. What we've heard between the two studies is quite a practice changing aspect that at least half of these patients would never have a mediastinoscopy and that half of them would only have the EBUS before uh, proceeding. So uh, that alone is quite uh, practice changing whether this, uh, your number needed to uh, to uh, perform uh, mediastinoscopy, whether one out of 11, one out of maybe eight or nine uh, uh, in the other uh, is uh, 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 a low or high number is, is a matter of, of continued discussion and debate. But these are, uh, I find that there's a, a fair amount of agreement between these two studies, uh, to be quite honest, and they both imply the same approach to patients. Um, what happens in the future will, will have to be decided. Uh, questions for either Dr. Zielinski or Dr. Rintoul, please. Um, yes, please, I'd like to ask a practical question. So when the patient comes in to have the endoscopy, yes. that's a day It's case, a day case. In yes. and out. Indeed. And then if they're negative, they yes. then have to come back to have the surgical. That's right. And yes. how, how long is the surgical dissection that you do to find whether they have cancer or not? And well, what that, does that involve? Okay, I'm a, day, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I'm a physician, I'm not a thoracic surgeon, yeah. but as I understand it from my thoracic surgical colleagues, a standard cervical mediastinoscopy, which is actually a much simpler and lesser operation than the Temla, is now being performed in many places as a day case. So in, in and fact. out in a day? Yeah. And, and Temla? Tamla uh, needs a short hospitalization. So, well, what, two days? Two days. Two days. Yes. Okay, and then if you decide that the patient needs surgery, they go away and then they come back again for surgery, do they? You yes. don't do the surgery immediately. Well, I didn't uh, go in these details in my presentation, but uh, we, uh, we, asked, uh, we started to combine the Tamla and vaslobectomy in selected patients. So, so sometimes, once, you do the sometimes we do TEMLA with intraoperative cytological examination of all nodes. And if the nodes are negative, we directly proceed to lobectomy. So it's just what? So that's t still two days? Well, in that case, it's, it's longer. It's no. about okay. five days or Thank you. Like, Thank you. like after pulmonary resection. Yeah. So there are different styles at different hospitals. Um, as Dr. Rintoul has said, in some institutions, a, uh, um, an ambulatory surgery approach is to do mediastinoscopy on an ambulatory surgical basis without overnight hospitalization. In other institutions for mediastinoscopy, not TEMLA, the lesser procedure, uh, it's still a one-day hospitalization overnight. It depends on style and patient. 
yeah. other risks. These patients often have COPD, have cardiac issues. So there are many reasons why uh, uh, different approaches uh, are taken then. In some institutions, for some patients, the surgical procedure, if, if negative, is followed immediately under the same anesthesia with uh, the uh, uh, definitive resection of, of the cancer. Other times it's done separately, and you can understand why if it's a positive finding that uh, there may not be immediate surgery at that time. So it is complicated, but all these factors relate to the, to the uh, cost analysis. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, patients, as a general rule, find EBUS and uh, uh, EUS as much simpler procedures, and uh, uh, that uh, these are procedures that, um, in skilled hands, are conducted with uh, not too much discomfort for patients. Another question, please. Um, it sounded like the main measure you were using for quality of life was the quality adjusted survival using the area under the utility curve. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Could you give us actually some numbers about that? F those findings. With the um, in, in in what respect? The uh, so what the area under the curve was for each of the two groups? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't remember that. I would have to look at the, uh, the original data, but I can certainly provide you with that. Okay, so that's not part of what you're reporting in your talk? Uh, well, I, I was, uh, in what we presented in the talk, we sort of presented to the headline bits, uh, but I, I haven't gone down to the sort of detail of going through the area under the curve. Um, our statisticians and health economists uh, spent, you know, at the end of the day we produced a 100 page report for the health technology assessment on this uh, and it's, it's, I'm a clinician, it's not my, you know, area of expertise, uh, but I, I can certainly provide you with that data. But there was a statistically significant difference in the area under the curve for the two groups? The uh, difference um, was uh, 0 0.015 uh, quality uh, adjusted life years um, between the, the two groups, uh, if memory serves. Um, and I don't think that was uh, statistically significant, um, but the, uh, it uh, moved in the direction, because what you, you, you can look at the um, quality adjusted life years, with the cost effectiveness and the um, to do the clinical, uh, you, the utility assessment, you obviously then factor in your um, quality of life assessments, and when the two are uh, in together, it became significant. Quality of life and adjusted life years yes. together. Yes. Yeah. And so, could you make any statement in terms of the clinical meaningfulness of the difference, what it means to patients, whether they get the EBUS ES first or go directly to mediastinoscopy? Um, well, yes. You have to, what you have to do with this is you, I don't think you can take one bit in isolation. So it is very important that you look at the clinical effectiveness, as I said, and uh, then build in the uh, quality of life and uh, the cost effectiveness. So yes, I think in, in uh, totality, taking the three parts together, we can say very clearly that patients should start their investigations with the endoscopic approaches and, as I said, only go on to having a surgical staging um, if the EBUS in EUS is negative for malignancy. Um, it is, as I say, much simpler for the patients and uh, should be uh, cheaper in different healthcare environments. Now, I think one thing I should point out is that all these, uh, this work that we've done and presented has been, although it was done in three different European countries, we took the entire data set and interpreted it initially using the UK social tariff uh, for application um, for working out the clinical, uh, the uh, cost utility and the NHS, UK NHS reference costs for working out cost effectiveness. Now we're also going to apply, because there are separate social tariffs for each country, and as you can imagine, resource use in each country is different depending on the healthcare system. We're working on that for Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, now, I, you, one could extrapolate and do that 
using this data set for any country in the world, technically. Um, and it would be interesting, for instance, if we did it for the US, where the healthcare uh, systems and uh, tariffs and reimbursement, etc., is, is very different with Medicare and so on, to see how it, it comes out. Um, yeah, but we haven't done that yet. The, we're getting late in the hour. Any other questions by the press? The speakers will all be here and the presenters for any individual questions you might have. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. I'd like to thank our presenters. And